So you'll have to bear with me. So the first part of the talk will um, address human-computer interaction and human factors. So to give everybody, I guess, a similar foundation upon which to build. Um, then we'll talk about how it's applied to patient safety and the work of clinicians. So before finishing up with design principles that have been pulled from other industries but shown themselves to be applicable um, in healthcare. And you may not have thought about this, but um, over the years, since 2001, we've given this talk or, or some version of this talk or of a similar talk um, to computer programmers as well as clinicians. So it's not only clinicians that are interested in this. And in both cases, skepticism usually exists, but for different reasons. The programmers believe that they know all of this, that they've made the buttons the right um, the right color, the right size, they put the buttons in the right place, and everything should be okay. The clinicians believe that, if, and for those of you on the phone, air quote, bad people would follow the directions and do what is right, air quote again, then we wouldn't have any problems. And so a good way that we've kind of come up with um, to kind of get everybody out of that assumption is to play a little game, and everybody likes games. So this game um, is called the Game of 15. Is there anyone who's seen this game already? Good. Okay, so um, it gets at the fundamental reasons of, of one of the fundamental reasons for giving such a talk. So for the game, I would need two volunteers. Do I have two people to buy? You don't have to get up or anything. You just have to be willing to call out numbers. It's okay. You won't die or anything. Okay, you have one in the front. Okay, and the woman in the back, black turtleneck, okay. So basically, here are the rules. You'll take turns selecting a number. You have approximately 10 seconds, as, as well as I can count, to um, select a number. So then each number can only be selected once by, by a player. So, if, so you have to shout your number out so the, the, the other player will know what number you've selected. And the game ends when one player when one player has, has collected a set of three game pieces. So you want to select three game pieces that add to 15. So any questions from our game players? You have to select three numbers, they have to add to 15, and you go one at a time, you have 10 seconds to do that. Okay, so here we go. There are your numbers. We'll say ladies first, and you can select a number. One. One. Eight. eight. So you select eight, next. Nine. Thirteen. So you got to select one number that's up here. Sorry. <laughs> so you select five. You select another number. What did he say? He said five. Three. <laughs> right. So you select three. Two. And he selects two. Okay. So what was difficult about this game? Right, what else? You had a, a witness that you had to be with him. Okay, is there a way that I could have made this game easier? Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Who won? Who won? Let me see. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So the second person, your name? Mark. Mark won because actually he got to 15 in a select, a, he selected three game pieces that would actually win. So the point of the game is to let you see that if the numbers would have been in a, in a graphic display, like the one that's up on the board, what would make that, how would you have then approached your solution, um, young lady in the black turtleneck? Maybe I'm one, but I was with nine and five, so I there. Okay. So if it, was, if it was displayed this way, how would that have been easier? That in the back of the pink shirt. Right, and what's good about this? A better surprise. Right, and, and, and the solution is transparent, right? So if you're trying to get to 15, if it's displayed like this, you don't have to do as much cognitive work to get to the solution. And also, having the previous demonstration, it induces biases that are consistent with the task. So the numbers are not in any way that would help you 
um, solve it. But this way, it kind of leads you down a path to select, a, to, to select the numbers that are correct. And why do you think that is? The first, if we'd have put it like, sorry, if we would have, if we would have displayed the numbers in this way, why do you think it? What made, what about this representation made it easier? There you go. So now the first demonstration is tic tac toe. So now you're not, you're no longer concentrating on the numbers. You can just demonstrate. You can just execute based on the way, way the numbers are displayed, what it then um, adds to your understanding. So you already have um, some experience with tic-tac-toe. You know tic-tac-toe to be a more simple game so that you're, no, you're not one trying to get over the hump of, okay, I have to listen to what he selects. I have to pay attention to um, how I can be strategic. And it, and it doesn't support this, the, the way that I originally displayed it doesn't support where you should focus your attention. And so the point of human-computer interaction in medicine and in information systems, particularly clinical information systems, is that they support, we want to focus on how can we help clinicians know where to focus their attention? And if we do induce biases, how can we induce biases that are consistent with the task that they're trying to do? So we're not making people have to jump over a hump, but we're making the path a lot straighter. Oops, sorry. Okay. So to give you a little background, uh, human factors or cognitive engineering, um, the cognitive engineering focus of the talk is um, an interdisciplinary approach in the design of cognitive systems. So when we talk about cognitive systems, we're talking about a collection of human and machine agents to perform a specific task in a specific domain. <clears throat> human factors engineering as a whole involves the study of all aspects of the way humans relate to the world. So in a traditional human factors uh, program, if you look at this uh, surgery, Photograph a human factors engineer. Human factors engineers could not only look at the lighting and how the lighting impacts work. They could look at the design of the machines in terms of audible alarms versus um, tactical alarms. They could look at the way the drapes are designed, um, what chemicals are best used. Human factors engineers could work in all aspects of this domain. Uh, the term human factors in ergonomics has only been widely used in recent times, and if you didn't know, that the, the field's origin was in the design and the um, use of aircraft during World War II and, um, in order to build in aircraft safety. Specializations in the field, particularly in cognitive engineering, include usability, human-computer interaction, some may have seen it machine interface interaction, or user experience engineering. So in particular, when we're dealing with interfaces, we're looking at <coughs> challenging situations, scenarios, tasks, and domains, along with actual practitioners, taking into consideration their expertise, their knowledge, and the strategies that they use to work. And we also know that they're supported by artifacts and other agents in the field. So an example, a simple example um, of a design that would take you from a go for a goal-based uh, design technique rather than a task-based. So in an everyday item such as a um, restaurant receipt, if the, if the restaurant would like to guide you in a way, a a, a, a induce a bias that is consistent with the goal that they would like you to do, um, one way to do that would be to guide you with, instead of allowing you to select your own tip, they can guide you in certain tip amounts or common tip amounts rather than a task-based design, which would just be um, a traditional tip amount of 10% or 15% as opposed to uh, making the suggestion, being proactive and leading you um, on that path. As I mentioned earlier, human factors engineering <clears throat> is a subfield of industrial engineering, which had its origins in fields where humans and machines interact um, over long periods of time. So you'll see lots of early human factors um, work done in nuclear power plant, nuclear power plant aviation, uh, NASA work, things of that nature. 
And some of you may have um, watched the movie Cheaper by the Dozen. Anyone watch Cheaper by the Dozen? If you didn't know that that movie is a fictionalized version of the life of um, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. And side note that Gil Lillian Gilbreth is one of the first what we consider industrial engineering um, females. Um, <clears throat> and so out of their studies, a lot of information um, came out about task, time and motion, but out of that, it kind of led us to begin to understand how do we differentiate between what machines do well and what humans do well. So some of those studies um, have shown us that machines are much better than humans in staying alert over a long period of time, doing things quickly, um, doing routine work that humans get bored at, um, short-term memory storage, as well as doing lots of activities at the same time. And what we found, we know that computers don't do some of these things as well as humans. So um, any kind of perceptual ability that requires stimulus generation or abstract concepts, um, the ability to improvise, all of that would have to be programmed into the artificial intelligence, judgment, selective recall, and inductive reasoning. So that has led to, <coughs> excuse me, um, some kind of, I guess you'd call them uh, rules of thumb that, that we use to kind of um, do design these days. Um, one, you've probably heard this before, that people can only remember seven plus or minus two chunks of information at once. So while there's individual differences, this is a kind of um, a, a, a rule of thumb that we teach our students when they're designing um, information and they want people to take um, information from one screen to the other, that um, they should keep these things into, a, uh, take these things into account. That we're very good at recognizing and poor at re recalling. So you would, it's much easier to off offer people um, a multiple choice of answers rather than having to, to fill in the blank of something that we process their environment, we process our environments by categorizing, and that there's individual variation on how we do that. So we have to offer um, alternatives, particularly for experts and novices and how they do that. And then particularly for design, which the programmers are always interested in, is that people assume relationships based on position, color, and shape. So when things are next to each other, people assume they have some relationship. If they're the same color, if they're the same shape, we begin to build on those things and, and consider them to be similar. <clears throat> and as we think about um, human-computer interactions, well, so specifically what we're here to talk about, um, the definition of a special interest group of the computer and human interaction um, society is that human-computer interaction, we're concerned with the design, evaluation, and more recently, the implementation of interactive computer systems. And for the most part, we want to stay, keep our focus around the human use. And as a human factors engineer, I um, constantly push this with programmers that we want to be user-centered, that developing methods to focus on making the users more productive at their task, that the system is not the concern of the user. Um, you don't care how it's programmed in the background. It doesn't matter whether or not um, the things are acted out uh, using Java or C++. The, the most important thing is that it gets done what you need it to get done. And so the best user interface is one that's invisible and that it allows you to focus on your task, not on, on what you're looking at. So as we begin to think to help programmers and, and others that are involved in the design of, of human-computer interaction, that they need to think more about just writing codes and how the systems are actually used by people. And so the goals of, of, of evaluating interfaces and looking at how we design and how they impact work is to understand how users view the system. Why do you make the decisions that you make? So that involves people coming to understand what do you do? What causes the biggest usability problems? We can uncover many small details and can produce a lot of great data with just a few, uh, just a few users. Unfortunately, what evaluation doesn't do well for us is that sometimes we can focus on the, the critiques by, um, of users about what they think the problem is, and what we have to remind ourselves is that users are great users, but not great designers. And so all of that human-computer interaction stuff 
shouldn't have to be done by you. You shouldn't have to come and redesign a system. They should be able to come, understand what it is that you do, and be able to design it given their expertise to, for best use by you. So we understand several things about good software and about good systems. That they're clear, that they suit the workflow, that they're functional, that they're adaptable so that new users and experts can both use them well, that they're satisfying, that you enjoy working with it or at least you can get your job done and flexible so that the user is empowered. Oftentimes, the design stops with clear, that it's an attractive and visual design, which is unfortunate because all it does is we, we understand that people like how pretty it is without understanding that um, we also want to know how predictable, how, how consistent and easy to learn it is, as well as that the interface is, a natural from the, is natural to use from the user's viewpoint. So as an example, um, taken from a, a sample um, computer system, so for um, experts, the right-click option would give you the data about a drug, whereas for a novice, they can also find that information by clicking on the active medication list. So <clears throat> one of the uh, really eye-opening things for some people is that human beings really and truly are harder to change than machines. So if we should take advantage of the fact that we can change machines and understand that the physician, nurse, the IT person, and the pharmacist are concerned about different issues, that we need to be concerned about all of their issues in design. So just to keep this from being uh, me talking at you, um, I'd like you to think about this act, to think about this little activity real quick. So imagine a piece of software that you're that you're thinking about developing requirements for. So think about a key document that you use in your area. <clears throat> so for nurses, it might be an IO sheet, it might be a handoff document, or a med reconciliation paper. So everybody, get in your mind some document that you use on a regular basis to do your work. So once you have that in mind, think about who uses your document as a primary user, and then start to think about who are the secondary users of that document. So if you think about um, how it might look or some key visual or interaction features, it's often very easy for us to think about the primary users of a, of a system. So for instance, in most barcode medication administration systems, they consider the primary user the nurse or the person that's actually giving the medication. Who often get um, overlooked are secondary users of such a system. Those that might be interested in whether or not a medication was given at a specific time. Those that might be interested in um, if something was not given for a specific reason that might not be in the electronic medical record yet, but would be in the uh, barcode medication administration system. There are a couple of, of design myths out there that you may even be experiencing right now as you deal with um, um, developing a system. I do have to say, though, Epic is a very good, um, a great company, and several of, of Wisconsin uh, human factors engineers actually intern there all the time. But um, one of the biggest um, design myths is that just because you involve the user, the user, the interface is going to automatically use, be usable. And that's often not the case, in particular with users who haven't worked the floor or haven't worked in that job um, within the last um, you know, year or two. The other big design myth is that because it's a graphical user interface, which is GUI, that, it, that, that because it's that, it's easier to use just because people can point and click, which we know is not the case. And that button and drop down list automatically make GUIs more usable. And we know that not to be the case with all of the different drop down lists, drop down lists that go on for pages and buttons that are located in the wrong place. <clears throat> and often what you'll see is evaluation by design. So people will come in and say, all right, we're going to demo this, and we want you all to come in and um, tell us what you think. 
The problem with evaluation by demonstration is that all of the time the results are positive. Nobody ever misuses the system. Um, you can't tell about issues with people who've not seen the system you know, from inception. And it wastes working time because basically you're there watching someone show you the great things and not show you how you'll actually be using it. But evaluation by, si by silence is also a, a real tricky one in that if no one complains, people will think, well, it must be okay if nobody says anything. Or the one that we found that's most prevalent with programmers is what I know is what I like, so I'm going to design the way I like things to be, which we all know everyone is not the same. And so in hum human-computer interaction, we like to look at these four big questions. Does it support your workflow? Can real users use it? Have we met the purpose? And is it consistent and meet standards that we have for the organization? So there are three main ways that things are evaluated, and if you're not seeing these evaluations, um, you might want to think about um, how well you, you can get across what the system is, the system meeting your needs. And so there are different ways that you can do evaluation, and, and they have different purposes, who does them, when they do them, and what the purpose is. So whether or not they're done early in the design process, um, how often they're done, all of these things are very important. And one of the things that we kind of focused on at the GAP Center was methods to comp complement testing. So not only do we look at how the interface interacts in, in tests and in time where we're in the laboratory, but we also want to know through interviews, questionnaires, um, <coughs> usage logs, how are people actually using it in practice? Because each of these different methods involve different people, they get different information, and they also allow us to um, bring all of the evidence together to be able to support what we're trying to do. And so what you might wonder is, well, all, how does all of that um, affect me? Because all of these things um, affect deciding on who gets notifications when medications are missed or when medications are um, not used or when they are not ordered. How do the alert message? How do the alert messages get worded? If you in implement additions to the tool menu, how do you let people know that those tool menus have been amended? Are there certain site-specific settings that are going to be available? Um, which order sets are going to be used? Who decides those order sets? All of this has to do with, do with human-computer interaction, and all of this has to do with how the system is actually used. So the takeaway points from that little section are that that um, the user interface design is always going to be more successful when you know who you're designing for and how they're going to be using it. And that one tool that we've used to help designers do that is a task role matrix. So that um, in your design, you're not concentrating just on who does what, but in this role, how do they do these tasks? And what do they need to be um, accessible to? What screens do they need to see? How often do, are they going to use them? And usability goals are only an, object, are an objective measure of, of, of success in addition to what we see in actual work practice. Oops, sorry. So now we're going to talk, what you're here to see about is more about how, do, how does this impact patient safety? So a couple of years ago, um, several researchers began to um, think about how do we look at advancing safety? So the IOM came out with their report Talking, talking about needing a systems approach to understand how errors happen. And that we have to move beyond blame and build partnerships across stakeholders to make um, advances in that. And so we've probably seen uh, this diagram or this, this, this picture several, several times. But um, what people don't understand is that human-computer interaction is an integral part of how complex systems fail. So the latent failures that are um, present in the um, different aspects of the system can be propagated or saved by interfaces. So if you haven't seen this uh, uh, de design before, um, reason, and this has been updated by uh, Richard Cook and Dave Wood, to look at the institution, the organization, um, the information, technical system, and the individual all work in concert. And if there are latent failures 
in different in, in the way these systems operate. So at the institutional level, there may be mis mixed messages going across, you know, we might be pushing that we want safety to be a concern, but then there's still a pressure for um, production. Um, there's production pressures within the organization. There might be inadequate training. We have a, um, attention distractions in what we're doing all day. The, there might be maintenance that's not happening for one reason or the other. The technology might be clumsy. All of these things um, are happening every day. And what um, there are different triggers that come up against these bad barriers. There are goal conflicts between these um, institutions and, and between these, these items. And there are things that are pulling at you at both on both ends. And so what we um, what um, Richard and uh, Dave have um, began to expand upon is that we have these defenses, but sometimes the triggers, all of the holes in the system align up and that sometimes we do have errors that get through. So here's an example case that a lot of you um, <coughs> know a lot more about um, than me, only that um, I've been uh, doing it a lot, <laughs> talking about this case a lot. So uh, here's an example of, of a metoprolol overdose. A patient received four times the intended dose of metoprolol twice a day for several days, but there were no, no lasting adverse effects, just for you to know. So the 80-year-old was admitted to the hospital and diagnosed as having a GI bleed, intracranial stenosis, diabetes, um, and a lot of other uh, um, issues. So they were on many, many, many medications in, a different, in addition to metoprolol, um, some of which are glyphosate, metformin, lisinopril, furosemide, lots and lots and lots of things. So when using the transfer command in their computer order entry system, as they were preparing for transfer of the patient to home, 50 milligrams instead of 12.5 milligrams BID were erroneously ordered. So the dispensing pharmacist dis detected this discrepancy, met with the physician and the patient, and then hand wrote the change in the administration instructions to take a quarter of the tablet, because the patient already had the medication, instead of taking one tablet on the medication label. The physician discontinued the erroneous order and issued a new order, which was verified and filled by the pharmacy after the patient was discharged from the hospital. Several days later, the patient presented to the hospital complaining of dizziness and shortness of breath. He had taken medications according to the printed sheet from the pharmacy that had not been updated with the change. So when the patient was evaluated, informed of the change to the metoprolol dose, another medication was discontinued and home <clears throat> the home health nurse was requested to increase visits to daily visits all week to check on, on his blood pressure and make sure the meds were taken as ordered. So follow-up with cardiology was scheduled in two days. Contingency plans were set up with the patient so that if he continues to have symptoms or return to the ER, the chest pain continued, that they would then take some other medications and then the call 911. So the first story that would be presented is that the patient um, you know, was taken off this medication. He was dizzy and short of breath. So okay, the physician ordered the wrong dose, the pharmacist didn't change it in the planning sheet, and then the health nurse missed the change on the medication label. So that would be the first story. That would be the usual. <coughs> that would be the usual response. But as we think about system design and how human-computer interactions could impact that, the second story then tells us a lot more. They were short-staffed in pharmacy and nursing. They had been missing the, the home health nurse was missing the updates, but that the fellow. Um, that did the discharge medication was helping out the resident. We know that um, the medications were changed on the day of discharge to fine tune the blood pressure, that the discharge order were done on the morning of discharge. But we also know that the default dose was one tablet, even though it was um, a quarter tablet to the inpatient. There was no, are you sure, checking for the medication dose. In the, in the information system. There was no way for the home health nurse, either through the electronic med medical record or through the interface, to contact the provider. There was no overview interface so that, the, so that the, all of the clinicians would be able to compare the inpatient and outpatient meds. The, um, one, the medication wasn't available in the smaller um, dosage, and then there was um, no health, home health nurse to visit the day of discharge to get that update. 
So there were lots of things that went wrong. And so as we think about moving toward a systems approach and how humans and how we can uh, make systems more robust, <clears throat> A human factors engineer would see that the status is hidden, that there's no place on the interface or no place in the system for the current status of the patient to be updated or to be visible. There was inconsistent labeling and terminology, that there were hidden features of the system that were unavailable to everyone. It wasn't easy to recover from errors, and that there were poor navigation aids to help people along the way. But rather than trying to blame the people who were at the point of care, in a new look at patient safety, we want to examine the sources of failure, not only from those at the sharp end, where all of the care practitioners are, but also <coughs> excuse me, at the blunt end, where, the, where um, opinions in the field, resources available to them, policies and procedures, um, and organizational culture stems from. So as we think about human-computer interaction and, and, and how it affects patient safety, even though it's directed, we want it to be directed at the blunt end as well. We want to involve sharp end agents and the health, um, the healthcare team and the patients in the design of tools. We want to evaluate the tools that people use and then recognize that there is complexity in the system. But we have predictable strategies. We know of the predictable strategies that workers use and that are, and that are inherent in their work. So we can investigate the side, the side effects of change so as we implement these new technologies, implement these new um, interfaces, we can then um, make positive steps towards safety. So I want to talk a little bit about what we found in terms of how does this impact the work of, of clinicians. We know all of these things from human performance research. We know that um, during handoffs, those are points of weakness and that we can design better systems to handle that. We know that fatigue can cause problems. We know that during times of high production pressure, people develop ways of coping. That teamwork is a way that we can build resistance into the system, and that even as we help people detect, detect errors, we have to help them recover from those errors. So the way that um, human factors and, and system people in general think about um, Healthcare is that it's a distributed cognitive system. That there's work being done across multiple agents. There's a stream of activity going on. There's this bigger organization. We have ebbs and flows of activities, and tools are used in every part of the system. And so, human factors understand that all of these things are going on, and that we need to take this all into account because there are large amounts of data available. And how, trying to help people focus on what is important. Is, is what we want to do best. That what data falls into what's the most important can change within the system state and within the, the um, problem uh, solving process. So we want to help people notice what's interesting, what it is they need to focus on. So in the Metoprolol case, we, wanted to, we would want them to be able to see the discrepancy quicker and not make that problem like the game of 15, that they're trying to jump over these walls, but if we can put it in a way that they can see it better. So we can re-represent and reorganize data to help the process of attention. So in, when we look at that complex world that you all work in, we know that there are issues around workload, coordination, there are goal conflicts that are exist, and we know that there's always deviation from routine sequences and change is ever present. So in particular, workload can be defined in, in, in many different ways. The perception of task demands by the human agent. So as the human um, sees what it is that they're doing. So it's dependent upon performance criteria, so how, how well they perform, how bad they perform, how this task is structured and, and how it's um, lengthwise, the complexity and then the variability. We also know from lots of human computer interactions, um, lots of human studies that people adapt to high workload. They trade accuracy for speed, so that if they're required to do things fast, we know they're not going to do it as accurately. They reduce that performance criteria, meaning that excellence is no longer what they're striving for. They shed tasks, meaning that they either don't do it or they give it to someone else. They defer tasks, so it's put off to another time. And then they recruit resources, so they go out to um, get other people to help them get things done. And so often, as we're seeing, there's growing and growing amounts of data. 
and, and people are getting overloaded. And so what we want to do is help them be able to process it before their cognitive resources are overloaded. <clears throat> Data overload has three main characteristics. Often it's clutter. There's too much data, and so it leads to the reduced number of data that can be displayed. When workload is high, there's too many things to actually do. Often the, the computerized answer is to have semi-autonomous agents do things for them, and then trying to find significance or meaning in that data. And that leads to visualization with abstractions in people's heads that may or may not agree with the um, models that are um, being used by the computer system. But what we also know from um, emerging Medicaid medical applications, nuclear power plants, NASA studies, is that users will ignore or um, they will ignore new or novel information, things that are outside of the ordinary um, if they're not in the regular stream of work, if they're overloaded, they will ignore that. They will abandon tasks that they deem not as important. They will trade precision for speed and time. They might not respond as fast. And then they might get distracted away from important information. So how do we help people when they're in that situation, when you have all of this information presented before them? One is to become an expert at the system. So if you know that the system gets really busy at a certain time, you're going to become an expert at how you get information where it needs to be. So the ED whiteboard to a lay person might be total confusion, but those who have been using that system over time have become experts in understanding what's the important information, what information needs to be acted on immediately. They will attempt to simplify, so then you begin to remove things from your field of vision. You know what is more important than the other. Keep the big picture, so um, as you saw earlier, the mention of a visual display, an overview display of someone being able to maintain the big picture, and then use of technology. And um, so you'll see the development of um, 3D technologies, graphics, and other ways to display information, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality. We can't expand human limits but so far, but we can limit the message rate. We can either lay out the um, information in a logical or an intuitive format. We can set priorities for people, help them to understand what's most important. We can filter and rank incoming data. We can design ordering schemes that will help people become better at that. We can use different modalities to present information. So whether that is um, getting rid of audible alarms, um, using more tactile techniques. But in order to do these things, people have to understand the work. And unfortunately, a lot of the systems that have been developed have been developed without your input. And so people know that these solutions have worked in other fields and are coming to medicine with these solutions, but what we have to understand is you can't offer solutions without understanding the work. So our first challenge is that we want to design the correct software the correct way. We know that there are loads and loads of software projects that don't work. And so one way that we can address that problem is scenario-based evaluation. And so what, we've, so what a lot of the work that we've done um, over the years is to design scenario-based evaluation to kind of help um, people that don't know the medical domain place people in actual scenarios that can, um, as much as possible, replicate the environment so that before we implement a technology, we can understand what could possibly be some impact of that technology. So those scenarios have to be robust. They have to be challenging. It can't be, no longer can you have a computer system and tell someone, okay, click open to open a new patient file. Click, um, uh, because no one is sitting at their computer doing that, only that one thing at one time. Everyone is being bombarded. And so we have to um, access the usefulness of all of the support techniques that are around them. We have to envision how roles and tasks change. Our second challenge is data overload. Right now we have too much data, too many activities, and we have to help people find significance. So one way we can do that is visual analytics. So being able to help people at the human computer interface to be able to handle all of the data that's coming at them. So those of you that are in position to impact how Epic um, design, we might want to think about how do we create long shot displays? How do we create overview displays? Is that applicable to what this group is doing? 
Can we um, aid in event detection? Is there any way that we can help people see better what is anomalous, what is not supposed to be there? Um, and then our, finally, our um, last challenge is that when work, when you require people to do work that doesn't um, likely impact them, the technology is not going to be successful. And so what we want to do is that as you think about implementing um, technology and as, and as people know that computers can collect lots of data that we think is not, that we think, oh, it's just another click or just another screen for them to look at before they get, um, and they're no longer using it. If it doesn't impact their work, then you need to really seriously think about how is this um, impeding what people are doing. And you can't, you can't not change work through software code. So you can't, it's really difficult to try to ask people to do things that is, that, that's not to their best benefit. And so the best way to do that is if we have interdisciplinary patient-centered teamwork, um, we can make sure that our interfaces, that our system uh, meet actual task requirements. So I want to give a sample example of something that um, we've done in the past and I'm currently working on, not with this specific system, but it's very timely in that we are now moving a lot of things to handheld devices. So this example was from a handheld um, application that was being developed to do barcode medication uh, through a handheld device. So basically we're migrating from a desktop interface to a handheld inter interface. So we already have lots of um, principles of design that we don't need to recreate, we don't need, that we already understand. We know that we need to design for error, we need to make things visible. Um, the, on your left side, you can see a schematic of the handheld device, which was, um, I guess I shouldn't say, but anyway, it was a, a handheld device that would be used um, to do barcoding techniques. So one of the, the, the primary findings that we found out immediately upon turning it on is that on, um, so on your right, you will see what comes up when you're on the desktop version of the software trying to um, confirm that this is the correct patient. What you'll see on the, on the left side is the, what um, the interface looked like uh, after we had some time to work with them. The original uh, interface that they designed, this uh, keyboard screen that they, had on the, that they have on the handheld covered up from the social security number down so that all you saw, all you saw was the patient's name. You never, you were not able to confirm the social security number, where the patient was located, what room it was in. So all of this information was covered up because the programmers at the time didn't realize that, not, that you're not only just want to confirm names, but that we also need to confirm other things to make sure that we're dealing with the right person at the right time. And so that the design of um, an interface, particularly a handheld interface with screen um, real estate is so crucial, we really have to consider what it is that we are deeming most important, what it is that's visible at all times. And it's something as simple as this that no one kind of thinks about until they actually try to use it. And so, which is why we always go back to, you have to concentrate on what the actual work is if we want patients um, to be safe. And so finally, um, just to wrap up with some human um, error and human um, performance issues that we know cause problems and that we know kind of um, develop. So most of the time, usually when something breaks down or there's a problem, unexpected consequence. So from a sample example, there we had a um, case where um, there was um, some nurses that were um, disciplined over a um, misadministration of mimicron. And um, one of the things that we saw initially was that one, there was a fixation on what we, they thought the solution would be. That there was an automatic behavior and that you would, um, which we call a slip of action, mean that when people just automatically pick up something as opposed to um, really paying attention to the difference between the two, um, 
There was a diversion of attention, increase, increasing the risk of slips so that you're not doing something in a, a calm, quiet situation, that you're always being interrupted. And then there was missing knowledge. So we know that all these things happen um, when you're interacting with um, people in a high workload time. And so we know from the human factors literature, and, and if anyone wants these references, um, I can be sure to share them, but that there are surprises when automation is strong and silent. So out of a lot of research around aviation access accidents and lab research, we know that when people make computers too uh, strong and when they do things without warning users, there can be surprises. So the classic example that we use with this that we actually saw in practice was the removal of antibiotics after a certain amount of time. So the administration thought that it would be good if that, you know, so we don't want to give these um, antibiotics after a certain period of time, so let's just remove them from the screen and the, the doctor doesn't have to worry about it. So, you know, we're helping people. But what they don't realize is that a secondary use of having that um, medication on the screen is that it serves as a trigger. As we know, people are great at recognizing rather than recalling. So if I haven't been on this ward for two days, when I see that there was a medication that's about to expire, that reminds me rather than me having to remember all of my own after seeing, you know, 50 other patients that, oh, this patient's um, antibiotics needs to be removed. And so you had people missing medications because of this. Then there's um, degraded team coordination when you transition from paper to electronic. So a lot of things that go on between paper with paper that um, people that are not directly in the work don't realize. So there are lots of things that paper kind of does just being present that when you transfer that to an electronic environment, you have to take that into account. And that is that, um, there are lots of studies of electronic flight strips and air traffic control that were done on paper, and then when they moved to the electronic version of those, there's a change in workflow, and people, we have to understand that before we make that change. And then advisory systems, um, increased workload during escalation, escalated situations. So when people are in situations that um, are high workload, advise, ad, when you have lots and lots of um, reminders coming up and alerts coming up, and I'm in a situation that's already stressful, alerts only add to that stress level. So we have to come up with um, alternative methods, and we have to make sure that we understand the work and understand the stresses of work before we design those systems. And then monitoring raises priority. So when things are monitored, it raises the priority in workers' minds and what it is that they need to do. So if you're monitoring the time that um, I give my 9 o'clock medication pass, and if it's more important that I give the medication at 9 o'clock rather than I give the, um, the medication in a fashion that um, takes patient care into account, then that needs to be represented in how the um, software is implemented. So as an example, um, there was a certain system that would track when uh, nurses gave their 9 o'clock medication pass. Now, if every patient in their medication pass had 15 to 20 medications, and there was no way for me to get through that um, in a timely fashion if I had to repeat some item that I was typing. So in this system, it was that whenever a medication was late, you had to document why it was late. Well, if all of these medications are late for the same reason, if I can't put that same reason in for all those medications at one time, you're then adding time to my job by making me type it out each individual time. And that might not be the point, but if you are monitoring that I finish at this certain time, then the document, then the information that gets in there might not be what you want it to be. So that's something that you have to consider. And then finally, automation increases rigidity for unanticipated, unanticipated situations. So if you have a system automatically do that, do, do one thing, it makes the system more rigid when something happens that you hadn't planned on. So if you don't want me to be able to say a medication was not given, or you make it difficult, but that is something that happens on a regular basis, and then you're monitoring on top of that, what ends up happening is that doesn't get documented as well as it should be. So finally, ways to address that, reduce commitment to the machine processes so I don't have to be totally um, responsible to the machine, but I'm responsible to my work. Increase observability and directability so that I can um, see what others are doing, I can give a tell the status. 
integrate authority and responsibility. So if I'm responsible for something, I should be able to have the authority to change it. Benefit the user directly. So in, increase the use of mem memory aids and then allow me to look in on other activities. In conclusion, I just want to fi finish up with that. Often with systems, um, clinical information systems, nurses are not the only users um, of, for instance, barcode medication administration. Physicians might use them, respiratory therapists might use them, aides might use them, quality managers might use them. So if you have all of these users, you have to take that into account. There is never a one size fit all, and it, it use evolves over time. And with new technology comes new roles. So with those new roles, we need to understand how do we introduce ways to troubleshoot, to report medication. If we don't barcode today, maybe we'll barcode in five years. That's something that we need to think about. We want to proactively seek out the side effects when we put in interface changes. And the flexibility is the key. There's never one ideal way to do things. And so um, the patterns of human performance failure are not usually evident if with just a root cause analysis. Usually, you need to look at handoffs, goal conflicts. There are different issues that we need to take into account. Um, we need to definitely think about um, all of the areas that are concerned around the interface. But um, one thing we also found in looking at um, involving human factors people alongside of clinicians, and that's the other thing I want to stress, that we never, it should never be an IT or um, engineering person going in alone. They have to, have to, have to have a clinical champion or a clinical partner, equal partner in designing technology. And that's all.